Hi, everyone. Welcome to the SESTIG webinar today that's talking, that has Anthony Mizumori and Dwayne Wilson presenting on Washington State Department of Transportation's Bridge Deck Construction and Bridge Rehabilitation Program. Uh, there are more attendees registered for the webinar than have logged in yet, so I will give them a couple more minutes and then I will hand things over to Anthony to begin the presentation. So everyone knows you can request continuing education credit for or professional development hour credit for this webinar. Just need to send an email to me requesting that certification after it's over. The webinar will be recorded and made available through the SESTIC website. All right, well, I'm going to start. Okay, the webinar is recording. At this point, I'd like to hand it over to Anthony. He is the presenter and will be starting with the Bridge Deck Construction and Rehabilitation Program. Anthony? All right, thank you, Vicki. Um, hello, and um, thanks everyone to, for joining us this morning. Um, today we're going to kind of delve into Washington State DOT's um, practices and with, with a focus on bridge durability and we're going to come at it from an owner's perspective with a couple different points of view. So I'm going to focus on bridge deck construction and new structures and I'll hand it off for the second half to my colleague Dwayne Wilson where he'll talk about our rehabilitation program. Um, so, uh, first up, concrete bridge decks. Um, I want to talk about durability, uh, concrete durability specifically, uh, and cover some topics related to design, materials, specification, and our construction process. So what are, what are our expectations for bridge decks? Uh, the bridge design code references a 75 year design life for bridges. So when all the statistics are being run to look at loads and safety factors for bridges, it tends to focus on a 75 year design life. But in fact, uh, for real structures, we hope to get closer to a hundred year or more useful service life out of these structures. And bridge decks are of utmost importance because they uh, tend to have the most extreme exposure to to the elements. This photo here shows a bridge deck under construction on the Deception Pass Bridge. This was constructed in 1935. You can see a lot of kind of old time methods and a lot more hand tools on the job site than you see in a, a modern bridge construction site. But this bridge deck is still in service. It's currently being protected by an HMA wearing surface, um, but it's it's held up for us fairly well for, for a number of years, and this is ideally what we'd like to beat with our new bridge deck construction. Let's see. So let's talk first about what our bridge decks are exposed to. And there's four items I wanted to highlight. Um, vehicle traffic, freeze thaw action, salts and chloride exposure, and shrinkage and thermal strains. So first up is vehicles. That's um, most unique to bridge decks, among other concrete flat work. Um, rutting is a primary concern. You can see the photo on the left shows bridge deck that's been filled due to excessive rutting. Um, rutting is oftentimes much more aggressive in areas where we've got studded tire use. Um, and then the impact from uh, the dynamic 
aspect of tires and truck axle loading. On the right, you see a full depth um, failure of a bridge deck in service. And rutting and impact are, are related because as a bridge deck ruts, it becomes rougher and it, that increases the dynamic pounding that truck axles deliver to the bridge deck, which leads to uh, spalling, delamination, and, and larger failures, as you see here. Um, one of the big keys to avoid rutting is the use of hard aggregate in our concrete. Uh, next is freeze-thaw damage. This is caused by water expanding within the capillary pores of the concrete and leading to scaling and material loss. Uh, the photos here show uh, that, that sort of deterioration on a sidewalk and a bridge barrier. Salt and chloride exposure is also a, a major concern. Uh, the, the salts uh, worsen the scaling due to freeze-thaw at the surface of the concrete, but of, of greater interest is um, the fact that when chlorides permeate down to the level of reinforcement in the bridge decks, they lead to the initiation of corrosion and spalling. And we also have thermal and shrinkage strains of the bridge deck. Uh, these strains often lead to cracking within the decks themselves as the decks are often composite with uh, the girders and elements that su support them. This sort of cracking has been fairly common throughout the country. It's something that a lot of states are working to solve and there have been a number of improvements uh, in minimizing this sort of cracking in recent years. And the cracking is obviously undesirable because it allows moisture to penetrate deeper into the deck and it can accelerate the other uh, types of exposure and deterioration that we're concerned about just on the deck surface. So briefly, um, what is durable concrete? Regarding bridge decks in particular, um, we're looking for low permeability, frost resistant, wear resistant, and uncracked concrete. And what is a durable bridge deck? It's durable concrete that's constructed smooth, sound, and with adequate protection of the reinforcement. It's fairly straightforward there. I wanna cover a few typical design details here. Um, this section here is a typical concrete bridge slab on precast concrete girders. Our typical bridge decks range in thickness from seven and a half to eight and a half inches thick. And that top half inch is sacrificial. We don't rely on that for any of our structural or strength calculations. Uh, we assume that at least a half inch of concrete deck will have worn away by the time we get around to resurfacing or rehabbing the deck. And our decks include two mats of steel reinforcement with two and a half inches of top cover and one and a, or one inch of cover on the bottom. And that difference in cover is directly related to the uh, amount of exposure that each surface of the deck sees. This detail here shows a typical plan layout of the reinforcing in a bridge deck. Um, again, two mats. It's the transverse bars running transverse across the screen here, which are primary reinforcement that distribute the truck tire loads to the girders. And for structural reasons, these are placed closest to the surface, which also makes them the most vulnerable to uh, corrosion. Uh, a note about the reinforcement that we use. Um, in our bridge decks, we use exclusively epoxy coated steel. Uh, this is quite common throughout the country, uh, the use of epoxy coated steel. Uh, in the past, we limited epoxy coated steel to the top mat of reinforcement and had specified uncoated steel on the bottom mat. But with the amount of cracking that we had been experiencing, there was concern that uh, the bottom mat was also not adequately protected. So we're currently specifying epoxy coated steel throughout our bridge decks. And that coating is intended to delay the onset of corrosion by uh, preventing air and moisture from coming into contact with the steel surface. And there's a number of other, of other alternatives out there, galvanized bar, uh, semi-stainless bar, stainless clad bar, or non-metallic bars. 
we've got a couple test projects looking into galvanized steel and uh, MMFX, which is a sort of proprietary semi-stainless type steel uh, to try to gather some cost data on this bar to find the right cost benefit. This photo here just shows our deck reinforcement in place. Uh, you can see it can oftentimes get fairly congested and so it's important that we do have workable concrete mixes. And uh, also related to design, I wanted to make a quick point about the profile grade on bridges. Um, our bridge decks follow uh, roadway design geometry and that's oftentimes that oftentimes includes parabolic curves and crowns and cross slopes and important it's important that we can construct our bridge decks to these specified grades and that might not seem like a durability concern on the surface but uh, it is important to ensure we're getting a smooth ride across the bridge to minimize impact from tire loads so how do we build this curve into our bridges uh, for cast in place concrete superstructures as you see here this roadway profile is built into the false work that supports the concrete. For steel girders, the roadway profile is oftentimes cut into the shape of the web plates for, for the girders before the steel flanges are welded. And for precast concrete superstructures, which are in fact probably 90% of what we construct in Washington state, there's not a lot we can do to shape the girders themselves. They come up with a little bit of upward camber, but that's difficult to control and predict. So what we do for these structures is to have a, a variable thickening of the bridge deck where that deck connects to the concrete, and that requires that the soffit forms for the bridge decks be adjusted constantly across the bridge span to accommodate this curve. So that's it for uh, the design aspects I wanted to cover. I'll, I'll jump into materials and I'll just give a quick run through of what, what the requirements we have on our constituent materials in Washington state. Uh, for cement, we're using type one, type two cements, um, sometimes blended cements, just general use cements. We don't allow type three or higher lease cements. That's oftentimes a challenge for delivering to distant job sites, but it also creates a risk of um, thermal strains and thermal cracking due to a higher heat of hydration and uh, potentially a higher rate of heating and cooling. Uh, we place a limit of the tricalcium aluminate in our cements to avoid flash setting issues, and we place an upper bound on the alkali content in it as well to mitigate for alkali aggregate reaction or alkali silica reaction. And when it comes to water, we basically require potable water. There's an alkali limit on the water for similar reasons. And for bridge decks in particular, we restrict them from using washout water in their ready mix trucks. So, you know, after a truck returns from the job site empty, they'll wash it out. Um, and we don't allow them to keep the water in the tank for the next batch of concrete. Um, our bridge decks often include a fair amount of supplementary cementitious materials. Fly ash and slag are the most common. I think that's probably common throughout the country as well. Uh, these help control the cost of concrete, but also seek to reduce the permeability of the concrete. And per our specification, we also allow the use of microsilica or silica fume and metacalin, another type of pozzolan. Uh, these, these materials are permitted, but we rarely see them proposed by our ready mix suppliers. A um, couple points about admixtures. Um, I've kind of skipped over aggregates. We're, we're blessed in Washington State with having some fairly strong and non-reactive aggregates, so we haven't had to place a lot of um, specific requirements on those. Certainly, there's, there's a lot of uh, interesting discussion related to aggregates and concrete durability, but I'm not going to really be covering that today. So on our, onto our ag mixture, admixtures. We have a 1% chloride ion limit to prevent uh, early corrosion. 
Here's a list of some of the common admixtures we see in our bridge deck concretes. Uh, the air and training admixture is key for freeze thaw resistance. Uh, water reducers and retarders are key for transporting and working mixes. And we also see shrinkage reducing admixtures in uh, all of our bridge decks. And I'll talk about that admixture a little more in a few slides. Occasionally, we'll see hydration control admixtures when we've got a case where there's a really long distance from the ready mix plant to a to a bridge site, we have allowed the addition of these types of admixtures. They're similar to retarders. Uh, they're chemically different. They they actually um, stop the hydration process as opposed to just slow it down like a retarding admixture would. And we do prohibit some certain admixtures, uh, mainly accelerating admixtures. Um, Historically, accelerating admixtures had chlorides in them, which was not desirable from a con corrosion standpoint. There's a number of modern accelerating admixtures out there that are chloride free, but we still prohibit those for the same reasons we prohibit type 3 cement uh, due to a concern over heat hydration and thermal cracking. So. Next up, I wanted to talk a little bit about how we specify our mixes in, in the state of Washington. Uh, and there's a, a couple different ways that we can go about that and that we have gone about that. One is a prescriptive type approach to qualify a mix. And it's sort of a recipe-based approach where you set a list of ranges for the constituents like you see here. You know, we can specify a cement content of over 660 pounds per yard, fly ash over 75 pounds per yard. Uh, we can require the use of water reducers and we can put a limit on the water to cement ratio. And these are all requirements that you typically associate what's, with what's considered a durable concrete. And this sort of approach works for most of the concrete that we place in Washington state. But um, it hasn't always led to the best results, particularly with bridge decks. And our current approach now is to, to take a more performance-based mix qualification approach where the concrete itself has to meet specific physical testing requirements prior to being qualified for use in a bridge deck. And so we can focus on the properties we're really interested in, like freeze thaw performance, shrinkage, and chloride resistance. Uh, so performance specifications or performance qualification specifications can be a little more involved because it does require a supplier to test all their mixes ahead of time um, or test their mix at least to uh, w with several different test methods. So there's a cost and there's some time involved with that qualification process that is more easily bypassed with a prescriptive approach where we're just uh, meeting certain recipe or constituent um, proportioning requirements. For our bridge decks, we've moved to this performance-based approach with fairly good results. Um, so our general structural concrete for cast and place work is we're targeting a four KSI compressive strength at 28 days. And we establish an air entrainment or an air content ratio between four and a half to seven and a half percent to give us uh, some freeze thaw resistance. Also, we place chloride and alkali limits on the constituent materials, as I mentioned earlier. So that's sufficient for most of the exterior structural concrete for cast in place work on bridges. But for the bridge decks, we, we needed a little more. Uh, particularly due to the cracking issue that, that we had seen. So our performance spec, and this is where the bulk of the, the recent innovations have come and, and the recent improvements to our practice have come, is from this spec and its ability to reduce cracking and bridge decks. So our performance specs include a requirement for air content or freeze-thaw durability. So contractor can propose a mix that either has the air in the four and a half to seven and a half percent range, but we allow them to drop that air content as low as three percent if they perform freeze thaw testing 
and the mix performs with at least a 90% durability uh, factor after 300 freeze-thaw cycles. So the photo on the bottom there shows some of these specimens that will be subjected to freeze-thaw action. So this allows the contractor, in theory, to play around with the air content to achieve uh, our, our target durability um, without compromising other properties. We require a rapid chloride permeability test to demonstrate that the concrete has a permeability of less than 2,000 coulombs at 56 days. Uh, this is sort of an accelerated test to pass charge through the concrete um, subjected to a voltage difference. And it's a measure of how permeable the concrete is to chlorides. Now, chloride ions generally move slowly over the course of years, and it's hard to qualify a mix on that sort of time frame. So this is a useful test um, to, to gauge permeability in a much shorter period of time. And so we've established a limit of 2,000 coulombs, which is generally consistent with an upper bound of low permeability concrete. Uh, we also require uh, a shrinkage limit for our performance specification. That shrinkage limit is 0.032% at 28 days. Uh, there's some specimens shown on the bottom right there. It's basically measuring the length change after that 28 days where the concrete specimen is exposed to drying. And the shrinkage limit is uh, two or three times less than what you would typically expect out of our old concrete mixes for bridge decks. And one other requirement I'll throw in there is that we specify an inch and a half nominal max aggregate in our bridge decks. Uh, the larger aggregate is helpful in reducing the paste content of the mix and therefore the shrinkage in the mix. So in the past, we had seen maybe three quarter inch nominal max aggregate mixes. So we're getting larger rock. So this isn't particularly a performance spec, but we did want to set an upper bound here too because we didn't necessarily want a contractor proposing a two inch aggregate in order to limit shrinkage when we were fairly certain that we're, we would have placement issues with a mix that had two inch aggregate in it, um, given the tight clearances and tight spacing oftentimes seen in our bridge decks. So a little bit more about shrinkage and the use of shrinkage reducing admixtures. Um, that shrinkage requirement of 320 micro strain that we require basically requires the concrete supplier to use the shrinkage reducing admixture. It's a liquid admixture. It's, it's, it replaces the water, mixed water, at about a one-to-one -one ratio, and we see about one gallon per cubic yard of concrete. And this reduces shrinkage by reducing the surface tension within the water. Um, this minimizes the internal stresses that develop within the capillary pores while the concrete is hydrating to reduce the amount that the bulk concrete, the, the, to reduce the amount of shrinkage the bulk concrete experiences. And this product oftentimes may require more air entrainment and, and high doses can destabilize the air void system. And I mentioned that because it's important that even, you know, even though we have certain performance criteria that we specify, they need to be compatible because oftentimes the approach to meet one criteria can compromise the other. And, and so it's not simply a matter of picking out sort of the dream uh, durability properties for all the tests you want to subject it to. There, there actually has to be an economical solution there, and sometimes that can involve some compromise. Um, so back to this issue of early age deck cracking. Um, this was a problem nationwide, and the, the photo you see here is maybe one of the worst examples we've seen in the state. This bridge was open to service for just a few months before this, this sort of cracking was seen at a very tight spacing. Um, so our dissatisfaction with this performance is what led us to a new mix specification and the Washington State University completed a research project with us in 2010 that led 
ultimately to where our current specifications are today. So why was cracking occurring? Uh, taking a step back, well, concrete shrinks and any form of restraint, whether it's internal or external, can lead to tension cracking. And so there's a few factors at play here. Um, one, as we push out span lengths further and further, our superstructures become deeper and stiffer. And the stiffer the supporting elements are, uh, the more restraint they provide against the concrete as it wants to shrink during hydration. Uh, two, we were finding that our mixes were more prone to shrinkage. You know, we as we targeted higher cement contents and the use of fly ash and other SCMs, uh, that's potentially leading to more shrinkage content or to more shrinkage overall with the higher cementitious content. Um, there's a wider use of admixtures as well, and it's not always clear how those play together and their ultimate impact on shrinkage of the concrete experiences. And we're seeing lower and lower water to cement ratios. And the lower water to cement ratio is typically a good way to reduce shrinkage. However, when you've got a highly restrained element like a bridge deck, um, low water to cement ratio can lead to a smaller total shrinkage, but that shrinkage occurs quicker. And the quicker it occurs, uh, the less relief you get from tensile creep. Uh, so the earlier you might see tension cracking. And lastly, our finishing and curing practices weren't necessarily focused on crack control, and that's something we've addressed as well. So just to summarize some of the changes that we underwent about five to seven years ago, we revised our mix specification to the performance-based spec that I covered. We reduced the max, maximum temperature at placement from 90 degrees to 75 degrees to ensure that the concrete is going to stay workable and finishable and can be uh, appropriately cured. We're finishing our bridge decks smooth. We're no longer texturing them while they're in a plastic state. And I'll talk a little bit about this process here in a few slides. And then we've extended our wet cure from 10 days to 14 days. Uh, this delays the onset of drying shrinkage by extending this cure, which allows the concrete to gain strength prior to, um, prior to the bulk of the sh shrinkage occurring. And in general, uh, a longer cure is good to realize all of the uh, all of the good properties that lead to a durable concrete, like permeability. So this this spec change has an impact. It you know it lengthens out our schedules and comes with a cost. But given the importance of our bridge decks, this is a, a delay we're willing to to pay for. So this slide here shows a couple photos. On the left is a bridge deck soffit constructed using the old approach, and on the right is the new approach. There's a, there's a pretty clear benefit. Um, you can see with almost no cracking whatsoever on the bridge on the right. And uh, the, the photo on the left isn't necessarily even one of the worst cases we'd seen with the old mix. So one other requirement we've added to our practice is the requirement of a 10 by 10 test placement using the bridge deck concrete at least seven days prior to production work. Uh, one part of a performance spec you get is you don't necessarily know what sort of working properties you're going to end up with. Uh, the suppliers didn't know that and the contractors didn't know that. So this is a way to make sure that everybody has a familiarity with the material before we start into production. So we ask that they demonstrate how we're going to be sampling for testing, how we monitor temperature, we look at their placement systems, their fogging systems, and their finishing operation. So it's sort of a pre-qualification of means and methods uh, for our bridge decks. And we've seen that the mixes have started to stabilize. A, a lot of the suppliers have their one mix that they go to for bridge decks. Um, but um, it's, it's not always the case that the contractors are familiar with the mix. So sometimes these, these demonstrations are fairly routine. 
but when you have an inexperienced contractor, it can be a very useful tool to get everyone on board uh, before you go out and pour a 200 by 60 foot bridge deck. So on to bridge deck construction. So we kind of went through some design uh, aspects and some material aspects. And uh, now I kind of want to get into how we realize the design and uh, material capabilities under construction. Uh, so the first step for a bridge deck is to set our formwork and screed rail elevations. Uh, this is a key part in making sure we've got a smooth ride. Uh, the soffit forms support the deck rebar and the screed rails on the left support the truss that the finishing machine is supported off of. So this is where we get a lot of the geometric control over where the uh, deck sits in space and what its final dimensions are. And we do need to com compensate for the deflection of the bridge itself under the weight of the bridge deck, which oftentimes can be several inches. A quick point about um, our epoxy coated reinforcement. It's, a, it's, it's an effective coating, but it can be weak when it comes to abrasion. So it's very important that this rebar is protected from abrasion in the field if we want it to uh, perform as, as we expect. So it needs to be bunked off the ground like you see here. And it's important that the iron workers don't drag it over previously tied reinforcement. And it's important that all of the intersections be tied using epoxy coated wire rather than uncoated wire. Uh, once the rebar is in place, we go through a dry run with our finishing machine. So the finishing machine is operated over the entire bridge deck area and we're measuring for clearances and cover, specifically that two and a half inch clear cover over the top mat of steel. This is where all the geometry has to come together in the construction process. Uh, the, the photo on the bottom there shows a truss that's over 100 feet in length supporting a finishing machine. So there's a lot of factors in play here. So if we're not meeting clearances, the contractors will oftentimes have to perform a combination of adjustments to the soffit forms, the screed rails that support the truss, and any crown that's built into the truss to compensate for its own dead weight deflection. So there's a fair amount of survey and geometrics that go into creating a bridge deck within the fairly tight dimensions and tolerances that we that we specify. Uh, now on to concrete placement, uh, getting to pour day. So before any significant material can be placed into the forms, we go through a round of acceptance testing, and we require that all that testing be done within an hour and 45 minutes after batching. And what, once the testing is complete, they can no longer add water to the mix. So we do test for temperature, and we specify a range between 55 and 80 degrees. I mentioned earlier we had moved to a 75 degree maximum. We were finding that that was actually pretty difficult for contractors to, re to achieve on a routine basis. So we did give a little ground there and raise that temperature to 80 degrees, but that's still uh, less than the 90 degree limit we had had previously. Uh, second, we test for slump. We have a three and a half inch max. Unless they use a high range water reducer, we allow up to five and a half inches of slump. And there's not a great correlation between slump and durability, kind of moving away from the importance of slump. However, it still remains a good indicator of consistency from batch to batch or day to day. It can flag something wrong with uh, production or batching or delivery or pumping. And we also measure for air prior to placement. So again, four and a half to seven and a half percent, but we allow them to go as low as a 3% air content if they perform the freeze thaw testing to demonstrate adequate durability. And a quick point about acceptance testing. 
we require that all the materials used in our test be collected at the point of placement for bridge decks. So in this photo here, the concrete is collected at the end of the slick line off this pumper truck before it's molded or tested for, uh, for temperature. And this is important. We want to we want to be absolutely certain that the concrete going into the forms meets meets spec. And it's um, not uncommon for concrete to um, increase in temperature a fair amount in these pump lines, and also to lose air. Uh, so the longer the pump line, the, the more of a challenge this becomes. It's not uncommon to see contractors hosing down the outside of their pump lines on hot days to try to limit the temperature gain that the concrete will experience. Now about placement and screeding. Uh, so the process is demonstrated here, kind of or shown here going from um, right to left. Uh, at the leading edge, we have laborers with immersion vibrators to consolidate the concrete. The finishing machine following that, which we require on all bridge decks, it's it's got augers at the front end to distribute the concrete more evenly, followed by a vibrating tamp to perform some secondary consolidation after the augers have moved some of the concrete. That's followed by rotating steel drums, which actually strike it off to grade. And the drums are followed by two pans that are drug across the surface for final finishing. And following that, um, we require floating if there's still porosity on the top or lack of consolidation on the top of that bridge deck surface. We do test for smoothness at this point while it's still plastic and we're looking for an eighth of an inch tolerance over 10 foot. That's usually just measured with a 10 foot straight edge. And uh, we generally encourage contractors to do this work from work bridges and that's essential for, for wider bridges. Um, the photo here on the bottom right is kind of a case we don't want to see. It's a laborer stepping into the concrete to, to fix um, something that's not quite consolidated on the top, but he's going to now have to repair his, his own footsteps on the way out. This is all fairly common, unfortunately, but this one's particularly ironic because there seems to be an unused work bridge in the background right behind him. Um, so the next step it comes the curing process. And um, just to clarify, I mean, when you say curing, we're talking about the controlling of the temperature and moisture around the maturing concrete as it hydrates um, to promote durability. So this is different from hydration itself. This is just to provide a, an environment where the concrete can achieve the properties um, as close to possible as what we can get in the lab. So our goal is essentially to maintain uniform temperature and uniform moisture throughout the bridge deck to promote uniform hydration through the section. And this is what gives us low permeability and uncracked concrete. Um, we can't always control this, all of these variables in the field. It's, uh, although there's been a lot of changes to concrete mixes over recent years, the way we cure concrete is fairly similar to how we did decades ago. And I will note that oftentimes the rate of change when it comes to temperature or moisture is oftentimes worse than the magnitude of those swings because there's a bigger chance that we're creating uh, temperature differentials or moisture differentials uh, or maturity differentials throughout the bridge deck section. And that leads to um, lower durability and more cracking. So what are the steps that we specify? So the first step is the initial curing after the finishing machine passes. We've moved to a fogging requirement. So the contractor has to fog sufficiently to maintain a wet sheen on the top of the concrete until the final set has been reached and we can install a final curing system. Um, we definitely want to avoid windy days if we can. Uh, you know, high winds are going to completely negate the effect of foggers. 
and dry conditions or dry weather makes this even more challenging. We used to use liquid membrane curing compounds, but oftentimes those can't be applied until uh, closer to final set. And so there's oftentimes, um, you know, an hour or more or possibly several hours of time between finishing and the, the installation of the first curing system. And uh, it's when it comes to curing, curing at the early age is uh, much more important than cur curing at later times. So this is why we added the requirement to maintain foggers on site. Um, and when it comes to maintaining uniform temperature, uh, the, oftentimes the best thing you can do are to avoid extremes in the weather. You don't always have that choice, and so there's ways to control for that. And we, and we follow typical hot weather concreting or cold weather concreting practices that can require uh, cooling or heating aggregates or the mixed water. Then after final set, we move to our final curing system. And as I mentioned, we've increased this to a 14-day cure. We typically apply uh, soaked burlap with white sheeting on the bridge deck. The soaked burlap maintains moisture on the top surface of the concrete uh, to prevent any evaporation. And the white sheeting serves to reflect some of the solar heating. There's also other products out there um, that are purpose-built for concrete curing. The photo on the right shows one system. It's just a one-piece curing blanket uh, that's saturated uh, and white for reflectance as well. Uh, the contractor has rigged up a pretty good system here where they just unroll it on the bridge deck from the spool and they've got a little sprinkler system to saturate it as it goes down. This sort of material is, is very similar to a diaper but it retains moisture better than the burlap. So if you've got a bridge on a steep slope, you know, you tend to lose some of that burlap water as it drains away, whereas these curing blankets can retain that and um, prevent the contractor from having to collect as much of that cure water runoff. And additionally, um, particularly for cold weather, we can require insulation or heating. Uh, they can insulate from um, above and below, oftentimes the soffit forms are sufficient, but in extreme cases, we've installed heaters between girders below the bridge deck or also uh, underneath tents on top of the bridge deck. Now, ideally, you'd like to heat from both sides in order to keep uniform heating, but as long as there's not a sudden thermal shock that you're imparting, it uh, seems to work okay. And we do set a 40 degree minimum temperature for the concrete during these, these 14 days. Um, we want the contractor to keep the temperature above that minimum. If they go below it, uh, they lose credit for a day of cure and have to extend the cure. And that's a good incentive for the contractor to promote good practices, but ultimately it's hard to make up for a day of curing early on in hydration by extending the cure longer. So a note about texturing. Um, as I mentioned, we used to uh, texture the concrete while it's plastic, but now we finish the concrete smooth and after the cure is removed, we uh, provide a texture with a, a diamond grinder running longitudinally. You see that process here in this photo. And this, this texturing provides traction to the bridge deck surface. Um, and it's, it's all done after the curing, after the cure is complete, which is nice. When we were tining the bridge decks transversely, that was just another operation in the bridge deck construction process that uh, has potential to go wrong and can delay the installation of, of the cure system at times. Also, there is some concern that by texturing the concrete while it's still plastic, and this texturing I'm talking about is usually accommodated by just dragging a rake across the concrete surface. Um, there's concern that we're effectively increasing the surface area of the concrete, which actually speeds up evaporation from the surface, which is uh, not at all desirable from a curing standpoint. So we've seen good results with this longitudinal diamond grinding 
requirement for a bridge deck texture. So that's pretty much the end of the construction process and I kind of highlighted kind of five key points that we're looking for it, uh, that are important to achieve a durable bridge deck. Uh, sound materials is, is of utmost importance and that comes from our mixed qualification and our performance criteria as well as uh, proper consolidation and curing. Uh, achieving the right struct stru structural dimensions is key. Uh, there's a lot of the geometrics involved here to make sure that our, our deck has adequate strength and that the rebar is located appropriately. Uh, ride smoothness is key to minimize impact from tire loads and vehicle dynamics. This is incredibly important at expansion joints because these tend to get hammered the hardest and are oftentimes the first areas to start failing. Uh, concrete cover is obviously key. Um, you know, the, the more cover you have, the longer time you have till the initiation of corrosion and your reinforcement. And uh, lastly, profile grade and super elevation are important to achieve. Kind of mentioned it's important that this, this kind of ties into getting a smooth ride across the bridge deck and it also ensures that we're not creating any low spots that could lead to ponding on our bridge decks. So, so that's basically it for our cast in place work and there are a few other topics that I think are of interest and there are things we're looking into. Um, I haven't really uh, put together much to present here today, but precast bridge decks are one area that's, that's receiving a lot of interest across the country. Uh, these decks can be prefabricated using very durable concretes, high strength as well, and it allows for rapid construction. Uh, the challenge with these systems is oftentimes the field connections. These generally won't have the same durability as the bulk precast concrete. They often lead to ride issues. And so there's a few ways to deal with those. You can overlay it after the fact with the cast in place system, or you can pre-overlay and grind. Um, so there's, there's certainly some potential here, but we tend to prefer cast in place bridge decks when we're uh, very focused on lifespan of our bridge decks. Uh, second bullet is fiber reinforced concrete. Uh, we've got a test project now where we're incorporating polypropylene fibers into an overlay to try to prevent cracking. This is something that Oregon State DOT and Caltrans are using pretty regularly with apparently good results in their bridge decks. Uh, lightweight concrete is another option. Um, there's a lot of testing to show that Lightweight has oftentimes very good durability, uh, sometimes more than normal weight concrete. But with bridge decks, the challenge here is that it, it's very hard to get the redding or wear resistance from the lightweight material. And another avenue uh, for potentially more durability is internally cured concrete. This is the inclusion of saturated lightweight aggregates into the mix and this the water that these aggregates absorb is kind of slow released into the concrete as it hydrates. So it's a way to maintain uniform hydration and extend the effective cure after your curing systems have been removed. Uh, and with that, that brings me to the end of my presentation. And so I think if time allows, we might open it up to a few questions. Is that right, Vicki? Yes, there's one question somebody posted earlier in the question box that says, you mentioned that the transverse rebars are placed on top because of structural reasons. Is this always the case for bridge decks in the United States? Um, it's always the case in Washington. Um, I believe it's, it's definitely the most common throughout the country, but I, I can't necessarily speak to the entirety of the practice. All right. 
So that question's been answered. If anybody else has a question, um, you can either raise your hand or post it in the question box. Okay. Zengman asking, could you comment on the use of UHPC? Ultra high performance concrete. Yes, that's another material we're looking into. Um, it's, uh, for those of you who don't know, it's sort of a high strength, flowable fiber reinforced concrete. And in the bridge industry, it's being looked at as a way to connect precast elements in the field with very compact connections. So splicing precast deck panels or splicing decked bridge girders. And we do have a couple projects uh, in the pipeline right now. I think one of them might be on advertisement currently um, that use this material to connect adjacent precast concrete girders. So uh, we're certainly looking to um, see what this product can do for, for us. Uh, we think it's got a lot of potential and um, there's a number of states around the country who have used it successfully. So we are we're kind of working out our our practice based around that material going forward. All right, one last question, and then I think we'll need to move on to the second half of the thing. Is texturing always specified as longitudinal or can it be transverse as well? It can be transverse and on our bridge approach slabs, which are oftentimes much smaller, those are at the ends of the bridge, we, we still allow the transverse texturing. Um, when it comes to the bridge decks themselves, uh, it's often easier to just run the equipment longitudinally across the bridge deck so you don't have overlapping or gaps with um, more passes than would be required with a transverse orientation. And I understand that the longitudinal texturing is also, it leads to a quieter ride than the transverse texturing. All right, uh, thank you, Anthony. And now let's move on to Dwayne's presentation. Dwayne? Thank you, Vicki. Thank you, Anthony. I just want to double check, Vicki, you're seeing the full screen? Yeah. For the presentation? I'm seeing the DOT's Bridge Deck Preservation Program. Good. So this is the second part. And what I will take on is how do we preserve our current network of bridges in Washington State? My job is to identify the, the needs statewide of all the state bridges and the deck program preserving our concrete decks is one part of the overall picture of preserving our bridge deck, our bridge network. So Washington State is kind of diverse. Um, we kind of have a couple of distinct regions. We have Eastern Washington, which is known to be a little drier, a little colder. Um, and then we have Western Washington, it's known to be a little bit wetter. Um, the Cascade Mountains, which we have several mountain passes that go through there. And we have a lot of snow during the winter time. The mountains in Eastern Washington get a lot more de-icing application which has implications on the deterioration of uh, concrete decks. And Western Washington is a little bit more uh, benign as far as the, the snow and ice periods. So we're not getting as many uh, snow and ice uh, periods over here on the Western Washington side. So this um, screen shows you kind of a couple different um, graphs. Uh, overall, our bridge inventory you can see, you know, concrete, we have about 75% of our bridges are concrete with about 23% are um, steel and 1% timber. Now, if you just take a slice of our concrete bridge decks, that's the graph on the right. Um, the vast majority of our concrete bridge decks are were cast in place concrete. We have some decks that are integral with the beam, which means basically precast either slabs or bulb tees that were built and then we're using that top deck as a riding surface. Fairly low on the state side, uh, more on the local agency side. The vast majority are the, the cast in place. 
And then you can see that graph, that bar graph, has two parts to it, integral and non-integral. Uh, integral basically means that the deck is part of the superstructure. I'll explain that in a minute with a couple slides. Non-integral means the deck is just kind of sitting on top of the, the uh, superstructure and could easily be replaced. Now, if we take a global look at the condition, and I'm going to explain how we got there uh, a little um, in, in the presentation, but our um, system, you know, about 58% is in good condition, 38 in fair, and then a small portion, 3.9, about 107 bridges, are in what we consider poor condition and would require some type of an action, uh, deck rehab or deck replacement. So kind of explaining a little bit, non-integral bridge types, there's a, a full range of bridges out there, steel girders and trusses and pre-stress girders and arches. Um, <clears throat> those types of bridges typically have a deck that you could easily replace, and it's not part of the superstructure um, when it was built. The integral, or we'll call them structural decks, are where the deck is part of the superstructure element. So whether it's a slab or a box or a T-beam, a floating bridge, the same segmental boxes or these bolt T's on the, the bottom right there, um, those decks are not easily replaced. So it's of the utmost important to preserve those decks the best way we can because if, if you're not able to preserve the deck, then you might be looking at bridge replacement in these type of bridges. And remember that, that reflects about half of our inventory's um, deck area. So one of the issues that we're looking at in, on the preservation side, we're looking at deterioration, rebar corrosion, that's the primary one. Anthony talked a little bit about rutting uh, because of our studded tires. Sometimes in the past, if a bridge was not correctly built, the deck, then the rebar would be like exposed uh, easily, and that becomes a problem over time. And then sometimes the quality of the concrete was just poor from the very beginning. So as far as deterioration, rebar corrosion, the whole mechanism, basically salt and water gets down into the rebar. The older rebar with no corrosion protection, no epoxy coating, would rust, and then it would form cracks, and then truck tires would hammer at it and cause uh, potholes. Here's a picture of a typical deck where the pink shaded areas are areas that are delaminated based on a chain drag survey. The other areas were temporarily filled with uh, some material by maintenance. So you can see here, like in this particular bridge, the deck is really deteriorated and needs some type of attention and it's due to rebar corrosion. Uh, Anthony kind of showed a picture of this pic uh, bridge. Um, if you're familiar with the Spokane area, it's a, the, the route to get to Spokane Airport on Highway 2. And you can see that the bridge was built in 64. About 23 years later, we put a concrete overlay on it. And then nearly 30 years later, we have close to an inch to an inch and a half rutting. Uh, so maintenance went out and tried some different techniques, partially filling some ruts, um, doing some rut fills, and then doing material over the whole lane. And these are kind of temporary repairs. You can see an aerial view of the same set of bridges. Um, realistically, what's going to have to happen is this concrete overlay is going to have to be removed and replaced. So the big deal in our state is studded tires. The studded tires cause a lot of damage. Um, there's always a controversy. We bring up the effects of that, but it's kind of an emotional issue. Um, so politically, we have not been able to outlaw studded tires, even though if you look at this list, there's a couple of northern states, uh, Minnesota and Wisconsin, somehow, some way, uh, got through their uh, system to outlaw studded tires. So here's a rebar cover. And so if the bridge was built with only about a half inch of rebar cover at one time, over time the, the wear on the bridge would expose the rebar, and then we have to go back in and fix it with some type of either concrete overlay uh, or another technique. Uh, poor quality concrete. There's just a time 
at some point in time in the future when the concrete will just break down chemically. You can see this bridge was the original Highway 10 before I-90 was put in over by Cleellum, and it was built in 1937. And so the deck lasted about 75 years, and then because of its condition, we recommended the deck be replaced. So how do we inspect and rate our decks um, in Washington State? We have kind of a unique system that is a combination of what the federal government requires and then a combination of a system that kind of works for us. So for a bridge deck, you may have uh, the concrete deck element. We have a different element to look at the bottom of the deck. We call it the soffit element. And then the bridge may or may not have an overlay element. So each one of these elements, we will the inspectors will look at and rate the condition. So as you look through a typical deck, we have four condition states. Condition state one would be good. Condition state two means previous repairs. Condition state three means the deck has some spallings. And then we use condition state four as just a placeholder if we had any delamination test results. On this particular bridge outside of Moses Lake, you can see that at one time, it had over 1,000 square feet of patching, which added up to 26%. When we looked at this bridge, it was built in 72 with a 7-inch deck. It still seemed to be something we could rehabilitate, and so it didn't need to be fully replaced. Here's a cross tab or, or kind of a crosswalk of the federal government codes that, that they require, which is a, a code system from 3 to basically eight, with three being poor and eight being good, we've um, associated that with the amount of deterioration on a bridge. And then, you, then we have a baseline for inspectors to say if you have this much patching deterioration on a bridge, then it translates to this NBI code. And then we can rate the good, fair, poor. A good deck would be a, a NBI code 87, fair 65, then poor 43. And then you can see the poor would be between or above 2% uh, deterioration. This comes in really handy on my, my side of the, the equation when I'm trying to determine the 10-year needs for the whole state. So here again is that same bridge. It was in poor condition in 2012. We went in 2013, uh, did a hydro mill and a modified concrete. So all those codes changed, and now the inspector would rate this as a good condition deck. This is kind of a key graph. It's kind of a deterioration rate that's based on all our experience. Um, so you can see some time in the future, especially bridges without epoxy coating, the epoxy coating will shift this graph a little differently. But as time goes by, maybe 30, 40 years, um, the deterioration will catch up. And then once you hit the threshold of 2%, then we program it for some type of an action uh, rehabilitation. We're hoping to get that before 5% because as this curve continues on down, if you let a bridge go to 10 or 20%, then your deck rehabilitation options um, are, are kind of gone and you're looking at some type of a re replacement, which is much more expensive. This um, summary is in our gray notebook, our current gray notebook uh, article that um, came out in September, it shows kind of a roll-up of the bridges in our 10-year needs. We have about 600 bridges that need to be uh, rehabilitated over the next 10 years. 18 of those are kind of in uh, con contract work right now. Past due for repair, 20. Due for repair, 50. And then what we're anticipating based on that graph, uh, previous graph, is that another 528 are going to be due over the next 10 years. So if you look at all of that and you look at the dollar figure, that's about a billion dollars. In order to keep up with that, we should be spending about 100 million per year to rehabilitate our decks. That's why when you're driving around the state, you might see more orange cones up, you might see more construction work going on. Unfortunately, we're not fully funded. Um, so we have less than half, maybe 40%, 30% of the funding we need. So now we have to get into an exercise of prioritizing our bridge deck statewide um, to see which ones uh, get the funding first.
So this graph shows you all the bridges that are in poor condition currently in our state. And the red dot means poor condition due to the bridge deck problem. Uh, and you can see there's a majority of those dots on I-90 places in eastern Washington, uh, a lot of places that get uh, snow and ice removal, de-icers. Um, so these main freight routes, we, we're going to have to do a lot of work to rehabilitate these bridge decks. Here's a kind of a combination of just different projects that we're, we're doing this year uh, around the state. And so if you've been driving around the state, you might recognize a few of these. And then what, what we have planned for next year is uh, not much. We just have a few projects planned uh, to do this, and then hopefully we'll catch up again in 2020 uh, with more projects. So what's going to happen is we rely on our WashDOT maintenance crews to patch our decks, to do temporary repairs, to keep them open um, so the public can, can drive across them. And so you'll see a lot of action during the summertime of these crews out there uh, doing temporary repairs. And then this is kind of the new normal. Uh, you'll see crews and the black material is a urethane based patching material uh, that the crews like because they can mix it um, at a wand and then they can get traffic back on in a short amount of time. This material cures out in about 20, 30 minutes. So here's a graph where I'm going to kind of walk you through some different categories in our bridge decks. We have bare concrete decks that were built prior to 1980 with just regular steel in them. And then we have bare concrete decks that have epoxy or rebar that were built after the 80s. That represents about half of our inventory. And then we've done concrete overlays, asphalt overlays, and polyester and polymer overlays. So when you look at the bare concrete decks, um, if you just look at um, an inventory of those, we have about 43 bridges that are currently in poor condition. The vast majority are in fair condition with a small percentage in good condition. Again, remember, these were built prior to 1980, so they have an average age now of 53. This particular bridge in OMAC is nearly 95 years old and it's still in decent shape. So when the inspectors look at this bridge in OMAC, when they look through the ratings, you can see on this lower part, the bridge deck surface, that little or nothing is going on currently. Uh, the concrete deck is in pretty good shape. So if we could go back in history and mimic this, whatever they did on this bridge, <clears throat> we could <clears throat> then have a bridge deck that could last 100 years old. So now, um, bear decks with epoxy or rebar. So Anthony kind of went through a lot of this already, but the kind of the history of epoxycar rebar, we had uncoated through 1980 in our state, and then we did the top map from 1980 to 2007, and then we did both maps from 2007 to present. And we have about 792 bridges total in our state with epoxycar rebar. This is important when we start looking at some of the details and seeing some of the deterioration, we can go back and kind of um, clue in on, on what was down on the bridge originally. So again, the epoxy core rebar decks are doing pretty good. Most of them are in good shape. 84 of them are in fair. In the 1980 to 84 and early in the 1980s as a whole, the epoxy coating looked different than what we have today. They, they tried some different coatings, black and brown, and uh, they weren't as thick as we have them on today. Um, so those early generation epoxy coating may start seeing some problems. Here's one of the first ones. It's uh, over in the top in this area um, on SR22. And you can see quite a bit of cracking in the deck. And then maintenance has done some patching. And then the inspection uh, has noted that. So we have about nearly 1% of the deck is now patched or spalled. So this will require some type of an action over the next 10, 10 years. Um, Anthony showed you this bridge. It's in Minette. Um, from this view, it looks like a very nice bridge. Um, it's um, you know, a very unique bridge. It's kind of constructed with the precast elements to kind of have a curved shape. And so it architecturally looks pretty good. 
And then on the bottom side, you can see for whatever reason, whatever combination of reasons, the deck had a lot of cracks in it from the very beginning. And we were recognizing this as a whole, and Anthony kind of already just talked to you about how the changes we made in our deck concrete. So on this particular bridge, you can see here, has some different pretty severe cracking in it. Uh, what we did is to seal up the cracks, maintenance went out and did a seal coat on the whole bridge, and we're hoping that that will um, do a better job at sealing up the cracks. So now concrete overlays, which is a fairly big portion, about 30% of our bridge decks have concrete overlays. Here's kind of the the flow of where we started with concrete overlays in the early 1980s, 1979. We did some low slump, then we changed to microsilica, fly ash. We did a rapid set uh, material that didn't really work too well. And then we are doing now some performance mixes, which are similar to what a brand new bridge is. Currently in our specs, what we would allow is we have a recipe mix for latex, microsilica, and fly ash. And the contractor can choose any one of those um, recipes. They generally like microsilica and fly ash because the mixes come through a um, ready mix plant. The latex requires a on-site mobile mixer, which most contractors don't like these days. And so a typical job, we will do a hydro mill deck preparation, which means we will take about half inch to one inch of good concrete off and remove all the bad concrete. Typical overlay cure is about 42 hours. And then we are specifying diamond grinding longitudinally again uh, for the deck overlay, similar to what's doing on new bridges. Now, if we have an existing concrete overlay and we're starting to get into second generation, a lot of those concrete overlays that were put in the early 80s are now almost 30 years old and requiring rehabilitation again. We've uh, decided to use a performance mix similar to brand new bridges. We've tweaked the mix a little bit. So instead of a 14-day cure, we're doing a seven-day cure. And then we are doing the diamond grooves. So as far as modified concrete overlays as a whole, most of them, over half, are in fair condition. You might see a lot of decks that look like this as you drive across the state. 44 in poor condition, that means over 2% patching. Um, the oldest 26 or 39, and the average age is 26. So this predominantly is our primary method of rehabilitating bridge, concrete bridge decks. We expect a life of 25 to 30 with a total project cost about $80 to $100 a square foot. Here's one of our earliest ones. It was put down in 1979. It's on Highway 2 coming out of um, Wenatchee. And you can see it's still in pretty good shape. So this might last the life of the bridge since the bridge was built in 1949 and we're not seeing a lot of wear on this concrete overlay. Here's a unique bridge. If you've ever been up on I-90 coming westbound, this is the Denny Creek Bridge. It was uh, the first segmental post-tension box girder bridge that we built in our state. Unfortunately, it was built prior to epoxy coated rebar, so it has standard rebar in the deck. And then it had an original LMC overlay that was put it down in 1980. And then we um, recently rehabilitated this. So if you look at it, it has a replacement value. The total bridge replacement value is about $200 million. So it's a very important bridge. Um, it also has a new, unique feature where it has transverse post-tensioning. So it's really important to preserve this bridge because if anything happens to that transverse post-tensioning, um, it would be very costly to rehabilitate this bridge. So we were starting to see quite a bit of patching done by maintenance in the overlay. We were concerned it was getting down into the deck. Um, so we programmed this for rehabilitation. And this is what happened. There was, did it in two stages, 2017 and 2018. Uh, first hydro milled the deck, got uh, some of the, the concrete overlay off, and then some of the original concrete off. And then we went back in with the concrete overlay. And same curing that the Anthony's kind of showed you, a wet burlap. And then here's final surface before they did the longitudinal uh, grinding. So if you ever get a chance, uh, you can you can see what that bridge looks like today. So as far as asphalt overlays, 
we have over a thousand bridges that have asphalt overlays. And this is kind of a typical paving train. You'll have dump trucks that dump into um, another piece of equipment that warms up the asphalt and then drops that into the paving machine. And this, this intermediate piece of equipment is really heavy on those two axles. And so we can't always allow those on bridges. And so you can see here, there's a breakdown of the different piece of equipment that material transfer vehicle can be very heavy. Um, and on roads, you can tolerate that. On bridges, not so much. So we have to be very concerned and looking at the weight distribution on our bridges. You can see here that this typical paving train could be over 260,000 pounds when the design of a bridge in that same span, in that same area, would only be for typically 164,000. So it's much heavier than the original design of even new bridges. So here's an example of Tacoma Narrows bridges. The um, new one is on your left and the old one is on your right. When we went to pave the bridges, we had to, inside our bridge office, design office, we had to look at the paving trains and then we had to kind of um, provide information to the contractor on what they could do on the bridge. So asphalt removal, this, thing, this is uh, something we didn't pay attention to quite in the past. These machines um, don't have a very good tolerance. They're designed for removing asphalt on roadways. We did it on bridges. And what would happen is they would remove the asphalt and then get down into the concrete deck and cause damage to the concrete decks. So here's another picture of if the rebar was close to the surface, the planers could damage the rebar, leave thick grooves in the bridge deck. So what we're requiring now is that bridges that are structural decks over 100 feet in length with integral bridge decks, we're requiring the contractor to scrape off the asphalt instead of grind it off with the rotomill. Here's a bridge if you've been down into the Tri-Cities uh, between Ken Kennewick and Pasco. First major cable state bridge built in the United States in 78. Um, pretty unique bridge, pretty architecturally pleasant bridge. Original cost about 30 million, replacement cost 120. It was designed with asphalt, and so we have an asphalt with membrane on the bridge. Here's a location map. Um, it was you know, more or less a city street that was turned into the state highway. The main state highway is 395, and so this 397 doesn't have a lot of traffic. But here it shows kind of a, a history of what we did on the bridge, uh, original asphalt overlay, and then we did a mill and fill, or it means taking off a portion of the asphalt of membrane, and then 98-2017 did asphalt with new membrane. This picture is kind of a original construction picture just kind of shows you that these segments are all integral, means the deck is part of the segments. So it's very important to preserve this bridge deck because otherwise you would have to almost replace each segment. So how do they do it? They scrape off the asphalt. It looks pretty aggressive with this uh, piece of equipment here, but um, if they do it right, it won't damage the concrete deck as a rotomill will do. So you see the scraping. You can see previous damage done by a rotomill machine when they took the asphalt off before. So these um, workers are putting down a membrane underneath the asphalt. Um, so polyester overlays, if we need rapid construction, we will uh, put down a polyester overlay. Here's a bridge on Highway 18. Um, polyester overlays uh, generally are in fair condition, three of them in poor condition. Um, we have 23 bridges over the in, in Washington State on DOT highways with the polyester. Average age about 21 and oldest 29. So we expect about a 25 year life. The nice thing about this type of overlay, it's kind of like asphalt, it cures in about two to four hours, has a little higher project cost, but then it gives us an option for rapid construction. Uh, there's a bridge in Seattle, uh, mainline I-5, where we did the polyester and it's still in pretty good shape. Uh, we did this overlay in 2007. 
we're going to do the other direction southbound in a couple of years. Um, here's the, um, the contractor kind of completing up a polyester overlay on Interstate 90 outside of Ellensburg last year. Then polymer overlays. Polymer overlays were, we tried a lot of them, but with our studded tires, they became smooth after about five to seven years. We're still using polymer overlays on movable bridges. So in summary, when you look at all the bridge types, um, we typically rely on the epoxy coated rebar to provide us good initial deck protection, and we're hoping pretty long term for all new bridges. Asphalt with membrane, we have over a thousand bridges, so we're still um, reapplying the asphalt with membrane on, on those bridges. And sometimes when the deck gets too deteriorated, we'll have to switch over to the modified concrete overlay. So modified concrete overlays is our, our primary method of rehabilitating our concrete bridge decks, and our trigger is 2% patching. Polyester overlays are used sparingly when absolutely necessary to get rapid construction. And then the polymer overlays are on movable bridges. So how do we measure success? One of those ways is if you look at our whole inventory and then you just say, well, how many of our bridge decks have we had to replace? 16 total. Uh, there's one bridge that isn't on the list here that some of the people, students from WSU might um, know about. It's outside of Othello on Highway 26. It's causing a little bit of a detour, about 15 minutes. And it's it's currently undergoing a deck replacement. But traditionally, most of our bridges we rehabilitate. So not a lot of deck replacements, which is a good good sign because the deck replacements are about three times the cost of a rehabilitation. So if you look at the cost from day one, uh, epoxy coated rebar is about a dollar a square foot. So it's pretty small cost in the cost of a whole bridge. And then you look at the asphalt with membrane, about $20. Concrete overlay, about $80. Polyester overlay, $120. Replacing a deck is $250 to $300. Replacing a bridge is about $800. So if, you, <clears throat> if we would have let the majority of our bridge decks go and we would have had to replace them, the difference in cost of replacing a deck and doing a concrete overlay is about $170 a square foot. We've saved about $1.2 billion over the last 35 years through our rehabilitation program. So now the, the emphasis is we need to keep it going into the future. So with that, that kind of wraps up my presentation. Um, Vicki, if there's any questions, um, we can take those on now. Yes, there's several questions. The first question is, does, US, does WSDOT use any sealer for bridge deck preservation purposes? Yes, we do. And so we have a program with our maintenance forces that we're using some preservation money to do deck sealing on uh, selected bridges. So we're looking at some of the older concrete overlays that have cracks in them. We're going to seal those. We're looking at some of the newer bridges to do some sealers. And the sealers come in two different versions. There's a silene, which is basically a water repellent. And then there's uh, methamethacrylate and epoxies that are actually a crack filler. And so you may, as you drive around the state, you might start to see some of these sealers where there'll be different colors on the decks. Um, you, you might start to see those from time to time in different parts of the state. Okay, next question is, how common is rutting on bridge decks? Uh, it depends on where you're at. If you're in Spokane, the answer is very common. Uh, Spokane, because of the nature of steady tires and the culture, will get about one inch ruts um, after about 20 years. And so the main Spokane viaduct, which is the I-90 through Spokane, you'll start to see rutting there. We see rutting up on Snoqualmie Pass, the mountain passes, where you use a lot of studs and chains. Um, so it becomes a lot more common as a bridge gets to about you know, 25, 30 years old and overlays the same thing. We're starting to see more rutting because we don't have the funds 
to do rehabilitation as often as we would like. So I think I think it's going to become more common, especially on the eastern side and in Spokane. All right. Next question. Other than the use of overlays and FRP composite materials, what other tools does you WSDOT have in their typical toolbox for bridge preservation or repair? So there's a lot of elements on bridges and different varieties of bridges that we have. So those, I think that they brought out, um, some of the composites, we're looking at those. Um, for column deterioration, we have used um, fiberglass jackets, steel jackets. Um, for rehabilitation of pre-stressed girders, we are using some carbon fibers for that. Um, so it's, it's a pretty broad topic outside of the bridge decks. We're looking at all kinds of uh, new techniques throughout the country uh, and just exploring uh, what other states have done and then looking at doing some experiments on different bridges. Okay, uh, next question. You mentioned maintenance going out and patching. What triggers this maintenance action? Number of potholes, size, etc. So it's basically any time a pothole forms and so you have a divot or a pothole in a bridge deck, maintenance crews drive over the roadways pretty frequently and so they get reports back. They also are getting information back from our inspection program which inspectors are uh, looking at bridges every two years and they're reporting back what they find at that time. So a combination of uh, inspectors letting the maintenance guys know and then the maintenance guys finding it for themselves. Uh, so it's, it's basically once they get a pothole that's formed on a deck, that's the trigger. And then they'll take an action from there. All right. Well, that's all the questions that had been entered. Uh, does anyone else have a question that they would like to ask? Either raise your hand or post it in the question box. All right then. I don't see anything happening there. So I would like to thank uh, Anthony and Duane for the presentation today. And I will be posting the recording on the website later today.